Hello, everybody. Uh, today we're going to have a chat about the uh, emergency rescue system that we have internally. Um, so we're going to walk you through all of the background processes that happen if our monitoring systems detect that something is wrong with your hypernode. Um, this is mostly something that runs in the background. It um, triggers once uh, one of our three monitoring servers sees that something is incorrect. Um, which happens through a, uh, a status call on your server, and then uh, we run something that we call internally the emergency rescue. So, uh, Rick, you're sharing your screen. Um, this is just a regular hypernode with a magenta shop on it. Yeah, definitely. So, uh, yeah, we have this hypernode here. It just has the, the sample magenta shop on it, magenta two shop. And uh, so before we start, let's uh, break this hypernode. Uh, so we can actually see that the outdoor reading is fixing it. If we're going to be talking fun. about it, yeah, let's just see if it actually uh, <laughs> if it does what it's uh, advertised to do. Uh, so this hypernode, it's uh, it's totally fine right now. Uh, I have the shop. I can click around. Uh, it's, it's just uh, a normal hypernode. Uh, so how do we break the hypernode? For example, let's just fill up the disk. If the disk is full, then there are skeletal processes that can't run. For example, your database will go read only or shut down or something. It's just uh, it's not going to work anymore. And that will simulate a very nice uh, broken uh, server. So uh, let's make a uh, big file, uh, big file that then no space left on the device. Great. And as you can see now, uh, it reports that it's actually uh, broken. So that already says why it's broken. But uh, now we're going to see the magic automation fix it, which is uh, way more fun. Yeah. So um, now you're running PD status. Um, this is an alias that we run internally to determine um, if the server is broken or not. Um, so can you type alias PD status just to show what it does internally? Yeah, definitely. So what we have is we have a sort of a test site on every hypernode. And that test site basically does everything you would expect your uh, application to be able to do. So for example, in case of Magento, uh, you, you have your Nginx, PHP, FPM, uh, PHP talking to MySQL, PHP talking to Redis, all these different things you need to be able to do to have a running website. So our test site basically does all those things. So if that doesn't work, it means that the server cannot host a uh, Magento-like installation or like a PHP CMS. And the reason we do that is that we can actually uh, differentiate between a problem with the application and with the server. If our test site works, we can assume that the server is mostly fine and we don't need to do anything to fix the server. So uh, when you run PDF status, you basically do get to that test thing, and it will tell you everything is OK. And if it's not OK, it will actually tell you if it is able to, what isn't OK. Uh, so yeah, let's talk about what actually happens in the monitoring now. So if you have your web, web shop, and it's actually uh, not responsive because something is going wrong, maybe the disk is full, like in this case, or maybe you have uh, uh, a shop that's become uh, slow or something for whatever reason, the PHP workers are filling up, something is stuck, it's out of memory. A lot of things can happen to a, uh, a server that makes it unresponsive. And uh, that is basically something for us to deal with. So uh, at that point, we have three locations in the world where we monitor each server. So that's like basic monitoring stuff. We just do uh, get requests, see if you are able to get this test site and make it report, okay? And if it isn't, then we know uh, we need to do something. So at the end of that whole process, of course, we're going to alert and notify a human. But in between, we have a big, elaborate, automated process that we call uh, auto-healing. We call it uh, Hypernode Emergency Rescue that does all these different steps to, to try to fix your uh, Hypernode. And uh, if at the end it still causes an alert, uh, of course, the real on-call on engineer will look at it, try to fix it, record his findings, and see what actually was going on. And once per week, we have a meeting, we call it the hero meeting, where we talk with all, with the, with all the on-call engineers and go over all the issues we had in the previous week. So that way, we can detect patterns in, uh, in what uh, issues we see on the platform and try to automate those as well. So today, I want to go through the whole list of things uh, that we do in this auto reading process to give you guys an idea of how it actually works and which steps we take to try to fix your site. Oh, so you can actually see you got, I got kicked out of my shell. Uh, and I think that must have been the auto healing trying to uh, fix the situation. So we, now we can log back in and uh, see if it's actually fixed. Not yet. OK, still in progress. That's good. So I guess my big file still exists. No, 
Okay, so I guess it's actually still installing the services at this point. Yeah. Okay, we'll come back to you here in a bit. Uh, it's still time to fix it, but uh, let's go over these steps. So uh, once this Arduino is started, uh, we first verify if we actually want to take action. So um, during the night, we often see that people run heavy calls. So if it's in the middle of the night, we are a bit more lenient with when those are auto healing actually start interacting with your server and try to fix things. So uh, for example, people can have heavy cons for product imports, syncing stuff, uh, who knows, things in the middle of the night are always kind of rocky. So we don't want to be interrupting that too quick. So at night, we kind of have a delay where the auto healing is a bit delayed so these automated processes uh, can finish. Um, so the next step is that our automation is going to check if we have uh, in our database a record of maintenance for the server. So sometimes people have planned maintenance. If they let us know, we can set a override on the system that disables the auto healing for them uh, if they want. Sometimes you don't want anything to mess with your system, even though it's unresponsive, because maybe you yourself are doing maintenance or something. So if that happens, uh, we can set an override and prevent this whole auto healing from happening. Um, OK, so. Um, if the server is offline, our monitoring detects this, and we need to uh, start acting on this. It's already been done for a few minutes. We're not going to immediately start messing with it. But once we actually start messing with it, uh, these are the things we do. So uh, Alex, let, maybe you can tell something about the diagnosis report we stole. So once this process is started, we also record information of the steps we took, and uh, we keep those for our support. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, um, for our support, but also for like uh, you, the customer yourself. Um, so if something happens and we detect that something abnormal caused the server to like return a uh, like a bad monitoring state. So um, with the PD status, you could see that something was wrong. Um, we try to store as much information as possible on the server itself. It's under the uh, incidents directory. And if you just can you just type uh, CD uh, incidents? Yes. You see, well, okay. So this server has had a lot of uh, <laughs> incidents so far, uh, this week. So it's, uh, it's yeah, abuse. exactly. This is uh, this is an abuse server. Um, so uh, we store a bunch of things in here. So um, most importantly, like uh, the current uh, uh, FPM status for PHP, uh, but also my SQL processes, uh, current TCP connections, that kind of thing. Um, that just to give you more of an indication about what was currently happening on the server when something went wrong. Uh, so that might give you an indication. Uh, I think in this case where you just fill up the disk, I don't think it's going to show you a lot of things, but if you type PD status in the moment, then you would see uh, that the root disk would have been full. So but it actually does. So in this really? case, as a user yourself, you can also find this directly and see what incidents there were on your server and get some information from the environment at that point. And in this case, because our disk was full, PHP wasn't running uh, or something like that. And then it just said, been able to get PHP FM status, but no master right. process. So that's actually a clue. So it doesn't tell you, hey, disk is full, but it is a clue of what is wrong. So if, if there is a situation where something specific is wrong related to PHP FPM processes, this would be a place where you can actually see which processes were running at the moment of your incident. So maybe you have like a specific page that takes like a minute to load. Maybe it's doing an external call. This is how you would be able to find some information. Yeah, and I think one other thing that we try to do is like if we find a known problem. So, for example, Magento had a bug uh, a few years ago where there were uh, too many MySQL connections to a database. Uh, if we find that exact situation, we try to inform you. So, if we can uh, be one hundred percent sure that this is currently happening, we'll send you an email saying like, "Hey, this is what's going on. You can typically fix it by doing." certain steps and we intervened to make sure that your server continues to run um but that could also be visible in this incident directory because then in the uh in the mysql output you could see a lot of processes running so that might be like a good indication of it yeah so this is extremely useful information but about the the, the mysql connections i'm going to i'm going to get to that because i have the whole list of things that we do uh and this is uh one of the steps we perform so i'll go to those steps right now uh, so the first one is that we, we have a uh, engineering configuration that blocks all kinds of things that we don't want to have happening on the hosting platform. So maybe there's traffic that we know is never legit. We block this across the board. So you know, think of uh, known bad uh, IP addresses, user agents, certain request patterns. We block those everywhere. But then there's also request patterns which are kind of gray areas. So 
if you see them, it could actually be somebody doing something that they actually want to do and they should be able to do, but it could also be that uh, somebody's trying to abuse this. And uh, in Magento 1, there was a very nice example, which was the download at endpoint. So in Magento 1, you could go to the downloader page and you could install and download uh, plugins for Magento. But this was always a very uh, interesting area security-wise. So this you know, was a place where people got hacked and, and uh, it, it caused a bit of an issue in, in, in the world of Magento. Uh, but we didn't want to block this everywhere because it was actually a useful feature for people. But as soon as we see suspicious traffic on that endpoint, we do want to block it. So we have a whole list of things that we know are uh, suspicious, but only in a certain context. And then, then at that point, we want to block that uh, type of request. So, uh, but this also is like requests from countries that you normally wouldn't expect on your uh, hosting. Uh, so this happens at this point in the emergency rescue as well. We detect your notice down, and then we go through the list of the PHP FPM workers and see what type of requests are currently running. So maybe all of a sudden you have all these requests from uh, China and you're not selling in China, then it's like, you know, pretty uh, good idea to block those requests because it's very likely that this is some attack of some, some kind. And so the thing that happens when that's blocked, it's something you can actually replicate in the command line tool as well. So we have a command, it's called hypernode block attack. What, what is it? Block? I think it's systemctl and then block attack. Ah, hypernode systemctl block attack. And you can see this help menu here, it's going to list you a bunch of things that once we start seeing traffic like that, it's it's definitely suspicious for the server you want. So, uh, and I can actually replicate blocking one of those attacks now. I can just say, for example, maybe I want to block, uh, let's see, uh, page speed brute force. So this is a specific type of attack we've been seeing uh, a while back. And it's going to post a job to the job board. And now this is going to interact with the Nginx config reloader that we have. So I think we talked about this before, but on Hypernode, you have a Nginx directory, and in there are your Nginx configurations. But if those aren't valid, they aren't actually loaded into your Nginx uh, configuration that's running on the server. So what this block attack command does is it tries to place an Nginx configuration in this directory. It's going to check if it's actually still valid. And if not, it's going to remove this Nginx configuration again. So it's, it's a safe way for us to deploy Nginx configurations into your server without having to worry about causing conflicts because you're very flexible in being able to configure your own Nginx configurations. There can be like overlap locations that conflict. So if that happens, we remove the rule again. Again, we don't do anything. Uh, but for example, in this case, where for example, we want to look at this uh, block China rule, this would block all the uh, IPs with a GUIP in China. And it's going to say hypernode automation, uh, place this configuration. And you will also get an email that says, hey, we detected some suspicious requests in your hypernode. And it's now blocked using this Nginx rule. So if you don't want this, if maybe, for example, you're actually uh, you know, some in this country or doing this type of uh, request for, uh, for legit, then you could basically just comment out these things and it won't be overwritten again. Uh, or if you're like, okay, the, the attack has subsided, um, I just want to unblock it, but maybe block it again once it's still uh, a problem the next time, you can just remove the file and next time it will be placed again. Um, so yeah, that's the, the, the attack blocking mechanism uh, for Nginx, uh, mostly PHP FM requests. So we analyze those types of requests. Once we start uh, seeing more suspicious patterns where we're like, this is always not legit, we can add it to this list of attacks that you could block. By the way, you can also use the API to perform this block attack mechanism, but really you don't have to because this is triggered uh, based on this auto healing when it actually becomes a problem for your server. Um, okay, so next is uh, the detecting uh, issues, known issues, detecting known issues. So we have a whole list of known issues that we actually have seen on the platform multiple times. And then we have programmed uh, strategies to deal with those known issues. And one of those known issues is uh, MySQL too many connections. So Alex just mentioned this. Uh, it's a very common situation where the application or something else is making too many connections to MySQL. Of course, you can configure the connections that you want to allow to MySQL to be very high if you want. But mostly, this is an indication of that something is wrong. So at this point in the process, we detect that. And then we send you an email if we see this happen. So that, then you have information for your developers. If you want to maybe uh, do something about that, investigate why it's the case. Maybe you have uh, queries stacking up. And so by the way, if you want to actually inspect the, the, the requests running in MySQL, you can run MyProx. Uh, it's a very simple areas for just showing the process list. Uh, but this can be very convenient to show you at the moment what's going on with the server. And again, this is also stored in an incidents directory, so you can actually look back later and find uh, the issues there. Um, 
Okay, next, Timo, maybe you can tell us something about the issue of unflocked calls, because that's the next step in this other healing where we try to detect and mail people about these unflocked calls. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> um, a while back, we um, didn't have this auto-flocking mechanism. So what we currently do with Hypernode is that when you add a, a new line to your cron uh, job configuration, it will um, append um, or it will um, wrap your uh, command with uh, flock. So what flock does is um, it will make sure that um, just one instance of that command will be running at the same time. So this is really useful, for example, when you run uh, cron jobs, uh, because cron jobs, um, we have previously seen that they, they could be overlapping. So uh, you run the, cron, the Magento cron job every minute, for example. Uh, what if there's like, um, if it takes very long, um, so you could have like five different cron processes running at the same time because the previous ones still haven't finished yet. So this can be a big problem. Um, and that's why we add this uh, flock um, around the command. Um, but yeah, um, when a node goes down, uh, it will check if there are any cron jobs that are running, uh, which aren't wrapped with flock. And if we can see multiple instances of, uh, of those commands, we will uh, start killing them. Um, yeah, that's basically it. So uh, we also uh, see that for example, these um, commands that are running uh, without flock, um, we very often see that the, uh, the, they start overflowing because of uh, the Magento queue consumers. Uh, because these uh, typically get uh, started from within the cron and they start a background process. So uh, in the situation where you do uh, something like zero downtime deployment with multiple release directories, Magento will create consumers for every release that you have. Or let's say it will run uh, consumers for the current release. So when you add a new release, it will not uh, stop the other jobs. So if you do like uh, 10 releases in a week, uh, you'll have like, well, how many consumers are there uh, in the default Magento, like eight consumers or something. So after a week, you would have like 80 uh, consumers running and Magento isn't like a very lightweight application. So let's say like 500 um, uh, megabytes per, uh, per consumer. Well, that's going to stack up a lot. So that's why we uh, take a look at that like, okay, we see a lot of processes that are running and they aren't wrapped with flock, so we start killing them. Uh, so this is like a uh, one of the first steps that we take. And so uh, it, it can be perfectly reasonable for you not to want to have these cons flocked. And if that's the case, and then you can add a comment, no flock, and then the auto flock riser will ignore it. So as you can see here, I just added a con. And uh, in a while, once the auto flock arrives runs, um, if it's at some frequency, I think every five or 10 minutes or something, it's going to add a sleep here, which is random, and a flock. So the reason why we add this deterministic random sleep is so that in case if you're running on a virtualized platform and we have too many hypernodes on the same physical machine, you don't want to have people running the con at exactly the same second on the minute every time, because then you can actually see steel spikes. So we spread these out very neatly so that people don't get in each other's way with running these cons. If they're on a, like a, a virtualized platform, uh, it's rarely the case, but it does matter if you just have enough people spiking at the same time. Um, yeah, so uh, mostly we've automated this, this with this other vocalizer, but it still does sometimes happen that the cons stack up and then we uh, try to inform people that, about this specific situation with an email as well. And I think the next topic is also uh, something for Timon to elaborate on which is that uh, we have uh, Redis out of memory detection. So in Magento, there is a situation in which they, uh, uh, there is things being put in Redis, which aren't properly dropped because of the eviction policy, right, Timon? Uh, yeah, that's right. Um, this could happen, for example, when you uh, start uh, storing sessions in, um, in, in a default Redis uh, cache instance, uh, there will uh, not be There is some uh, 
some background noise, I think. Oh, for me? For, for from my side, I think. Oh, okay. Uh, anyway, uh, so um, yeah, this can happen when you start uh, storing um, sessions in, uh, in in the default Magento uh, or in the default Redis instance, or uh, there were specific Magento versions that were also storing uh, objects in the cache uh, with no um, eviction policy. So basically, cache objects with no um, um, well end of life uh, or no time to live. So that means that it will um, if, um, exist in the Redis cache um, for an infinite amount of time. So when you run your application for uh, a few months, a few years perhaps, um, your Redis instance might um, become, well, entirely stuffed with uh, with these objects that uh, will not automatically uh, get removed from, uh, from the Redis instance. So and, yeah, and actually break your application, right? So at that point, yeah. your site might actually break. Yeah, yeah, because uh, Magento will try to um, store new objects in the cache, and it will not work, and it doesn't handle that very nicely. So then your application will crash. So yeah, that's a, that's a problem, and uh, we try to um, help uh, our customers with this. So um, yeah, whatever you were. Uh, going to tell uh, Rick. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So yeah. uh, in this auto healing process, there is a step that actually tries to insert a key in the Redis database and sees if it is, gets this out of memory warning. Uh, because if it does, at that point, we know we can email people a very specific message and tell them, hey, you need to take a look at how you use Redis, because apparently it's possible to go in a state where it's just out of memory and it's not going to affect anything anymore. So uh, yeah, so in that auto healing uh, phase of detecting these known issues, there are more things, like for example, uh, there is a very specific bug that happened in Magento. So this is an example of one of those things, where in uh, so a very specific version of Magento, um, advanced reporting caused uh, like infinite data to fill up in a temp directory. So these are the things that we can also detect then, and we can email you about. Hey, did you know that there is this very specific issue with Magento in your version? Um, and like I said, with this weekly meeting we have with the issues we encounter on the platform, we try to automate more and more of these things so that over time, you know, nobody uh, as a human has to talk to people and tell them about these things that we already can detect automatically. It's way faster to detect, to detect it automatically, and then people can act faster and uh, solve these issues. So uh, the next uh, step in this auto healing flow is actually detecting the temp uh, issues. And I can actually show you something about this as well which is uh, a tool we have. It's called Hypernode Purge Temp uh, uh, And this is a temp cleaner. So if your site is done because the disk is full and it's the root disk where the temp directory lives, we can actually automatically start cleaning this up for you in this point in the auto healing process. And uh, that's currently what it did when I showed you guys that I just fallocated the big file in here and then eventually it cleaned it up. But you could also run this command yourself. So if you have a directory of which you know that there is things building up, which are kind of temporary in nature, maybe you have an application temp directory, then you could use this command to specify the part of that directory and give it a lower bound threshold of which it should start cleaning up things. So what I have to do is fallocate again, big file, and I'm going to say uh, node purge temp tree. Um, I'm just going to run it. Okay, min three, well, some large amount. It's actually going to clean up this file. So uh, the auto healing does this, but you could also do this yourself if you know that you have a place where temporary uh, files build up and it needs to be cleaned occasionally. You could put this in a con, for example, or you could run it manually if you uh, ever want to get ahead of things. Okay, next thing is really cool, um, which is the uh, killing of MySQL if it's safe. So at the end of this whole process, you know we have to break out the big guns and we start restarting services and eventually restart the physical machine, like the sort of VM or the dedicated server. But well, before we do that, we have some more specific checks we can do. So one of the things we do is we start S-tracing MySQL to see if there are any syscalls in MySQL. Because it's it's sometimes it's a bit scary to restart the actual database, uh, but there are some things that can tell us if it's safe to do so. So for example, sometimes MySQL gets stuck in a CPU loop. So that means it's actually not doing any uh, changes to the database. It's just uh, pounding the CPU in a loop somewhere for whatever reason, maybe it's a bad query, who knows? But we can detect this by saying if MySQL uh, is using like 100% uh, CPU, but we're not seeing any syscalls from the MySQL process, at that point, it might be a good idea to kill MySQL. 
So we have some uh, code written that in this process will detect if we should be killing MySQL. Normally, if you restart MySQL, it's going to send, send a sick term, which is a graceful restart signal, kill, uh, stopping signal. But uh, there are situations in which automatically we will actually send a sick kill. So we just hard stop MySQL. It's kind of a scary thing to do. So we have to be very careful in which circumstances we want to do that. Because if you have a corrupt, da corrupt database, uh, that's a big problem. And uh, it's often very uh, difficult to deal with that. But if your database is stuck, sometimes this is the only way to fix the situation, actually killing MySQL. And in the audio reading, there are some provisions in when that might happen. Um, you, okay. uh, for, yeah? for example, uh, could you uh, show like uh, what this is called, um, how you could see this? For example, with the, yeah. with the trace of uh, sleep one or something? Yeah, actually, so uh, on Hype Note, we, we do something which is allow you as the user to s trace your own processes. So it's maybe a bit easier to show with PHP. With PHP. So uh, let's say I have this Magento application. I'm going to be clicking around here and to see some things. And maybe it's a bit easier if I actually, uh, yeah, okay. So I'm going to run Hype Note FEM, Hype Note FEM status, and it's going to give me a list of process IDs here in the first column. And I can say arc print give me the first column, and I just want to have the first one. So I can now say, S trace me this process ID. So I'm just going to say trace minus P, this process ID, and maybe I'll do F to also get all the threads, if there's any threads, in case PC probably isn't, uh, how many of these things I want, and for example, R for showing how long of each of these syscalls take. So if you do man S trace, uh, you can actually see all these options that are. Uh, it's a good man page, you may want to read it. Uh, but so you can run this command, for example, and it's going to start tracing. Uh, yeah, yeah, you forgot the head N1. Oh. Oh, uh, yes. Okay, so it's now attached to this process, and it's going to show me all the syscalls. So these are the, um, the application telling the kernel to do a syscall. That's, that's what you call it. But it's a good indicator of I.O. So if there is like writes and reads, this will be very clear uh, place where you can show it. So for example, if I now start clicking around this website, eventually my requests will end up in this PHPFM worker. And I can see exactly what it's doing and what it's waiting for. But this is on a very low level. So it's kind of hard to interpret, but it's going to give you uh, a very low level good idea of what your application is actually doing while you're waiting. So for example, what we also see a lot of the times is that people, they have a um, PHP FEM uh, request, which is running for a long time, but it's because they're doing an external request from that PHP FEM request. So their website's doing a, uh, an external call. And then in this trace output, that should be very good because you'll see all these uh, H stones request, right? It's going to turn a domain name into an IP and it's going to connect to the IP and you're going to see it receive all this data. And then you can actually tell where it's taking a long time to perform these uh, actions. And so it's a good way to see why an application is slow. Um, but of course, if you're a web developer, you're looking at this, it might be very arcane. And then it might be better to use something like New Relic or Blackfire to give you a more wholesome view of where in your application things are being broke down. Uh, but for us, this is a very good way to uh, be able to tell why an application is slow or what's actually happening inside this process. And as you can see, you can do this for yourself, for your own processes. You can trace this, uh, and it should be able to tell you uh, what's going on when you load the page. OK. Um, OK, so there's one more thing we do before uh, I'm going to tell you about the uh, service restarting, which is that we check for an unusual log volume in some places. So, for example, on your hypernode, you have all kinds of logs, uh, for example, for Nginx. And so these are the access logs for my application. So um, in these access logs, I'm going to find people requesting my site. That's going to be errors here. But sometimes you get so much errors that the log fills up so fast that it might actually fill up your root disk. Uh, of course, we do have log rotation. Logs get, logs get moved and compressed to a different place. So you can see these archives which are compressed makes it way smaller uh, but if you get so much errors that the log rotation cannot uh, keep up it might actually fill up your disk if you're already close to the, the border of filling up your disk and in that case in this auto reading process we also force a log rotation so we make sure that in this moment we also clean up these logs even though the uh, scheduled log rotation hasn't happened yet to make sure there is some space available for you to continue operating your actual um, if that happens you will also get an email that says we detected an unusual amount of Nginx error logs, for example, uh, and then you will know what to do with this. OK, so next, uh, we're actually going to start uh, breaking out the big guns, and we start restarting services. 
So we restart PHP, MySQL, Elasticsearch, Redis. Those are all the services that we can restart. And we try to do that to get your application back online. So I should mention that in this process of all these things that we mentioned, after each step, it's going to check if your application is already back online. If it's already back online, we just abort, we don't continue. So as soon as it shows signs of life, we're not going to do any of these steps anymore following this. So if we're at this point of the process, we've already tried many, many things to fix your uh, server. And then you know you want to resort to restarting services. So we don't want to restart the services, but if we did all these other things as well, this is the next prudent thing to do. So we restart PHP and then we build these processes. But after that, your application might be back online. So if that's the case, um, you know, we in our monitoring will know that this has happened. If, the, if this happens a lot of times, our support might reach out and say, hey, did you know you actually got uh, emergency rescued a lot of times? And you can actually also see this. You can put hypernet log, and it's going to show you uh, all these different actions that happen on your hypernet, for example, the emergency rescue. So uh, yeah, okay. And then the next step, which is uh, the second to last step, is we're actually going to try to reboot your machine. So that's really a, a, a serious step. But sometimes it's really necessary to reboot the server to get it back working again, especially in situations of out of memory. That's sometimes the case. We do have a very good control on the memory situation on Hypernode. We have uh, like an internal C group to limit memory usage so that the system at least will remain responsive. But it can happen that sometimes it gets in such a state where it's not even uh, responding to like uh, system signals anymore, power button signals. So at that point, we try to stop and start the server, hard reboot the server. And if at that point it comes back up, uh, then uh, you know the server has been rescued. But it's also possible it don't it won't come back up. And you know it's rare, but it can happen. But there are also hardware issues that may occur as well. So in this auto healing procedure, we then perform uh, a bunch of different checks to see if the disk is corrupt, for example, and then we inform the Hypernode tech team so that they can look at it. Okay. Um, yeah, so basically this is all that I wanted to uh, mention about this auto healing here. Um, is there anything else you guys want to add, Alex or Timon? Um, well, I think it's important to mention that after all of this process that um, if the emergency rescue doesn't trigger or it does it takes too long or um, you know at some point uh, we so the, for example the three of us uh, we get alerted we get a notification from our uh, uh, systems and then we're gonna have a manual look so we try to uh, add as many scenarios as possible to this system but at some point uh, this just doesn't cut it and something very strange is happening and then we're going to have a look manually and then hopefully we're going to find something that uh, has like a recurring pattern and we're going to add it to the system. So this is continuously evolving. Um, if, for example, Magento or whatever CMS releases a like a known bug that keeps on happening, we're going to add it to the system. So out of like these tens of steps, we're just going to add more and more so that we can automatically fix it as quickly as possible. Like, uh, we want to obviously prevent that we're being alerted ourselves, um, but it's also just to like get these systems up and running as quickly as possible is the, the best thing to happen. So I just wanted to add that, the continuous yeah. improvement. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so uh, the alerting actually happens in parallel with the system. So once all these steps are finished, if enough time has passed, then at, at that point already a human will be looking at this. So in the middle of the night, if we get alerted, oftentimes we log into the hypernode, and then by the time we start looking at it, it's already fixed because the other healing fixed it. But sometimes it isn't, and then at that point we start recording information. So we just write down things in like our Slack, and then oh, I'm seeing this, I'm seeing that. And then uh, we try to resolve the situation. And in the morning, we can actually use this information to inform people about what's happening on the machine. Um, it's also often a matter of intermittent issues. So in this case, uh, it kind of assumes that the, the thing is actually done for a prolonged time. Uh, we do have flap detection in here. So if it, if, it, if it flaps up and down and up and down, if it has enough down in it, of course, we're going to continue with this automated process. But there's also a situation in which uh, it's just too intermittent for this process to take hold. Uh, but then the alerting, of course, might still happen. And then if you get alerted, we're going to investigate and find out what's going on and improve this automation so that the next time it may actually catch what's going on. Uh, but yeah, this is uh, a list of steps that we do. There's more steps that we do. Uh, we don't want to highlight them all. These are the most important ones. Uh, and it's been very useful for us and also for the users so that we can quickly fix that issue 
uh, it's way faster 24 seven having a robot do it than having somebody actually look at it manually. Uh, but it's important that we do record all this information and we actually know what the automation is doing at all times. Okay, so I guess we're uh, through it for today. Yeah, great, thanks. Yeah. Okay, then we'll see you guys next time. And uh, thank you for listening. Yeah, see you around. See ya. <laughs>